My guest today is Amy Turner. Amy practiced law rather unhappily, but with no regrets for 22 years, and at 48, finally found the courage to change careers and become a very happy seventh grade social studies teacher. In today's episode, we talk about Amy's first book, On the Ledge, a memoir, which chronicles her struggles after a family tragedy and how it greatly shaped how she saw the world. This book offers proof that no matter how far along you are in life, it's never too late to find yourself. Welcome to Lifeology. Oh, it's so nice to be here, James. Thanks for having me. I am looking forward to this. I was telling you in the pre-call, your publicist, uh, Caitlin Hamilton, sue me. She is fantastic. So anyone who wants a publicist specifically for the books, I highly endorse Caitlin. And I will have this in the show notes of how you can connect with her as well. So now Wonderful. you, it's it's interesting. So you are just are now an author. Congratulations on your first book. Thank you. So we'll definitely jump on that in a second. But how did you know that you wanted to practice law? Well, you know, I uh, in college, I took a pre-law class, and I really loved the sort of intellectual mm-hmm. aspect of it because uh-huh. it combined history and, uh, and contemporary issues and political issues. But um, I think the jump to being a lawyer had more to do with differentiating myself from my mm. family. I came okay. from a family of teachers, I would say, and from my father, <laughs> who you now. mentioned... <laughs> Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) who mentioned that, you know, you mentioned before uh, there was some tragedy in my Mm -hmm. background. And so I think I was making decisions based not on my authentic desires, but on who I who I thought I should be or would be best for me. And so I became a lawyer. I, I did enjoy a lot of it. But, you know, at a certain point, I realized I don't like to argue. What am I oh, doing? Okay. That's, a, that's a good <laughs> so, point. What, what kind of law does your practice? Um, well, I started out in a big firm in New York City, and then we moved out to the eastern end of Long Island, and I was in a smaller firm. And I like to say I did everything except for um, you know negligence and criminal. Mm, so sure. real estate, uh, divorce, oh, nice. uh, family uh-huh. law, uh-huh. kind of oh, country wow. practice. And it's sure. states, it ha- states will. Oh, gosh, of course, yeah, yeah, those are huge. How did you make the transition into a seventh grade school teacher, though? Well, that that really was something. You know, sometimes people say, oh, you have such courage to write a memoir. No, I think if there was any courage, it was becoming a teacher because I was 48. Mm-hmm. I volunteered in a sixth grade classroom, not even my kids' class, because a note came home, and I thought, oh, I'll be a good citizen. And, and mm. I called my husband afterwards, and I just said, Ed, I adored it. I could just feel this surge yeah. of love when I was in there. And it's not, you know, these these were sixth graders. <laughs> they were they not scare me. They're easy. Scary. Yeah, they're not. And, <laughs> uh, but I realized I, I had such a, a wonderful response to it. And, um, you know, my husband, of course, said, we'll start to teach. And I thought, how can I go, mm-hmm. you know, at this age to switch? So I started taking graduate school education courses at night. I didn't tell anyone. And finally had to make the switch to student teaching. My my colleagues, my lawyer colleagues were incredulous. And, I bet. Um, and so then I made the leap after student teaching. I really did enjoy it. And I was so fortunate that mm. I was able to get a job locally you know, at my age, and there aren't sure. that many schools. I might have had to commute an hour and a half. So that's how I made the transition, and uh, so glad I did because for the first time in my life, I had the experience of looking forward to my job. Mm. Yes, yes, that's not just wonderful. tolerating it. Sure, of course. Now, to not to kind of get away from the family legacy, though, and then all of yes. a sudden to be like, okay, now I'm going to be a teacher. Now, how does that feel now that you fully embrace your authenticity and also? Uh, for following on the tradition of your family? Um, it was wonderful because I realized that, that that was my natural talent and mm-hmm. that I just enjoyed it so much. Now, let me not let me also point out that teaching is really difficult and it can oh, be gosh. a grind and it's absolutely exhausting. But the feeling I would get when a, either a student would get it, you know, have an aha mm-hmm. moment, or maybe I would just connect with them in terms of something, an issue that was bothering them. Yeah. It just felt like there was nothing more important that I could be doing. And um, I just love that feeling. And, uh, and you have to be creative in the moment. 
because if you're losing oh the gosh. class, you got to <laughs> switch gears <laughs> and figure yes. it out. <laughs> yes, you do. So after, after, being, you know, very successful in, as, as an educator now, what happened for you to say, I really want to write this book? Well, it, it's a bit of a long answer. Now, I had always wanted to write. Uh, it was something all my siblings, my father, and so forth. But I, I just was blocked. I, I would mm. hit a certain point. I call it the Turner Sludge. There was just sort of a swamp of depression, and I, oh, I would just stop. You know, it just it wouldn't go any further. So I gave up on that dream. Now, I do not recommend this for anybody at home, but I uh, was hit by a pickup truck as I was crossing the street. And oh. I had no internal injuries, no broken bones, thank God, you know, concussion and, and mm. um, so forth. But in the process of recovering from that accident and my... Uh, brother's very shocking death, mm. I started writing a thank you note to someone uh, for coming, and actually an English teacher, high school, who um, had come to my Herald's memorial, uh, unbeknownst to me, she had found out about it, so it, was, it gave us a beautiful tribute. And I started to write her, and this, honestly, James, this channel opened up that I had mm. never had access to. Really, The wow. lid just blew off, and these, these um, you know, memories and connections and emotions just poured out of me. Too much for a thank you note. Sent that off. <laughs> I, so I, um, I, yeah. And I, I kept writing. And, you know, my husband would just say to me, I've never seen you so happy. And I was wow. you know, teaching then. So all weekend, every weekend, I was just writing away. No intention to write a book. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I didn't know if this was just an extended diary entry, mm. but eventually it started to take form. I showed it to some people and honestly, it took on and off 10 years to write it. I mean, there was wow. a lot of off time. Sure, yeah. sure. Of course. Um, yeah. but so it was an endeavor, but honestly, not until the end did I decide that I wanted to have it published. It was always the motivation toward the end was always, I want this to be the best it can be. Mm. And then wow. at a certain point, you know, I decided, well, I'm just going to put it out there. And, um, and it, it's been a wonderful experience. Oh, I, I was filled with reviews. gratitude. It's, it's great. Yes. I, there was uh, some of the people that, <laughs> excuse me, the reviews that I read were saying how it's, there's a lot more humor in there than they thought because some of the topics are pretty, are pretty uh, dense. And so that was neat yes, to see yeah. the juxtaposition or the comparison of being able to talk about these things in a healthy way, but also, you know, the more serious things as well. So congratulations. Well, I, you know, I know you're a <clears throat> psychologist and, and probably uh, very familiar with defense mechanisms and avoidance mm -hmm. techniques. Sure. And for me, um, humor is always, you know, how I would try to deal with things. And, Honestly, when I got hit by the truck and I was, before the truck was off me, I was already cracking a joke to myself to try to oh, just pretend that I'm not mm -hmm. under a truck. I'd been carrying dry cleaning and the truck, you know, I fell back. The truck was on top of me. The dry cleaning was in, on my mouth. It was on my head and I couldn't move it. I couldn't breathe. And it mm. was getting scary. So I thought, you know, it was really scary. And so yeah. I said to myself, wow, you just got hit by a truck, but you're going to die suffocating on your dry cleaning. And like, <laughs> it just, I don't think I laughed, but I, you know, the irony was like, oh sure. my God, the headline. And yeah. so, and then, funny, I mean. you know, but I will say for, um, you know, writers out there, I, I uh, uh, as I wrote my a manuscript, I had a writing coach who said to me, pointed out that it, after every sort of tough scene or something, just as I was getting somewhere, I would veer off into a joke. She said, Amy, mm. you know, what are you doing here? And I first was defensive. I thought that is not possible. And she was yeah. absolutely right. And I had to go back and say, what am I avoiding? What truth mm. can I not face? So had to take out the glibness, 
but managed to keep enough of the humor that was truly related sure. to the to my sure. story and the content. I'm sure that would be hard to hear or read or uh, not, well, no pun intended, but to have yeah. to have the um, the coach tell you this because to have to sit there and be like, oh. I am being yeah. defensive or I am being, um, as a, you know, like you said, as a defense mechanism that what is there. And so, well, let me, that makes me transition into why did you choose to write a memoir instead of an, an autobiography? And for those of you who don't know the difference, because they're very different, an autobiography is just a chronological, chronological aspect of a person's life from when they were born uh, about a person. Biography is about a person. Autobiography is you write it about yourself. Where a memoir, a memoir is, um, you, it's the story of your life, but it has a retrospective aspect of, of giving the insight of what you learned and how that will impact you later on in the future. So that's the difference right. between, for those of you who, who may not know the difference of that. So why did you choose a memoir? Well, you know, as I said, the beginning of this was not intentional. You know, oh, what okay. didn't feel intentional. I just started writing. But I believe that, you know, um, subconsciously the drive to write it was mm -hmm. was somehow a way to integrate this random event of the mm -hmm. um, pickup truck mm -hmm. hitting me. I mean, I was in a crosswalk. I was staring into the windshield. that was crazy. And then my brother dying. And as I said, this wasn't conscious. But looking back, I think the, the, the imperative came from trying to see if these events somehow integrated into my life and as I recovered from the accident and I was writing it brought me back to the seminal event with my father and you know yeah, it's all about that. all about vulnerability and facing yeah. vulnerability so so the memoir really touches on all the scenes and episodes of my the trajectory that relates to that mm -hmm. so it's not a full-blown you know autobiography sure. okay yeah it makes sense when you were when you were a little girl, I don't remember how old you were. When you were really little, your father struggled with something. Can we? I want to glaze over that because I want to be respectful of you and your family. But can we talk right. a little bit about that? About how that impacted sure. your life and the hypervigilance that came from that? Yes, absolutely. So when I was four and a half, um, my father was on a business trip in New Haven, and he climbed out on his let on a ledge of his hotel window and threatened to jump. And amazingly, three priests happened to be walking by, and the one who, you know, had the capacity to help him, one stayed on the sidewalk in case last rites were necessary, mm -hmm. and sure. one went up to his room, and they talked, or, you know, he was there for 20 minutes, and then my father mm -hmm. climbed back in and was hospitalized for a year. My uh, mother was an active alcoholic at the time, and with four of us, four young children, he was hosp I don't know if I said he was hospitalized for a year. So as a four and a half year old, my perspective, I didn't know what had happened other than mm -hmm. one day my father's there, then he's not. Sure. And I wasn't told about this till I was 16. Oh. But the, hy the hyper vigilance came in because, well, you, I don't have to tell you this. You, well, you can, okay. you can explain this to the listeners better than I can, but, Children just know. They may not know the facts, but they perceive the anxiety, the tension. Mm -hmm. They're sensitive. So I knew something was terribly wrong. And, you know, my mother used to say, don't get that upset. Don't. And, you know, we say that to our kids, too. You know, sure. you're too noisy or something. But I knew that making a mistake that would get dad upset could have life or death consequences. Sure. I just knew it was that serious. And so that hypervigilance came from watching him, you know, it, does he look, are those eyes receding? You know, is my mother's, mm -hmm. you know, jaw getting even tighter? Mm -hmm. um, have I done something wrong? You know, checking myself. That's hard. Yeah. As a little child to have to go through all that too. It is. For anyone, so, but sure. Yeah. And when there's a secret in the family that, you know, the child begins to think, they're either responsible or they have the power to correct it. Yeah. So when I found out at 16, it was a shock, and yet it was so familiar because I would sort of had all the feelings. I just mm -hmm. didn't know the facts. So it completed, of course, I was a teenager and furious at my mother for not having told me. But sure. that hypervigilance, that, um, that pattern that started at four and a half, 
is something mm-hmm. that's just taken me decades to, to undo. And, mm-hmm. you know, I think it'll be there forever, but I have sure. some distance from it. Of course. Of course. Yeah. And I, I can't imagine, you know, well, first off, um, I'm, I'm glad that your father was able to get the help that he needed because as we know yes, that any, yeah, he did. I mean, that's so traumatic in so many levels. So I'm, I'm so glad to hear that he got, was able to get that. Uh, did, with that, how did you find that the hypervigilance, you know, was there in your life, but then you wanted to get away from the aspects of the teaching. And so you became something a law. So you practice something where you have to present a certain way. You have to, you have to know all the facts when ironically you didn't have the facts right. when you were a little girl. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, now exactly. you have all the facts here is in front of you. And now you're able to really, um, to really be in front of the, you know, to defend people, et cetera. How was it for you to, to allow the hypervigilance to, it impacted you negatively, but also impacted you in a healthy way? Well, how, how I did think, that play out for you? Um, well, I'll start with a negative for a minute that in terms of being a lawyer, that feeling of hypervigilance and the consequences of making a mistake. I mean, mm-hmm. the tiniest mistake the sure. possibility of a tiniest mistake would throw me into anxiety. It's such a wave of anxiety. Just, I, I you know, had to read every book on something to be sure mm-hmm. I had the right answer. And that goes back to that early childhood experience. The positive is that you really um, are conscious of the details and of the facts. And you look at, you review it over and over again to make sure that you're on the you haven't you haven't made a mistake, and in law mm-hmm. it's so precise. Um, it, the, you know the language has to be so oh, precise goodness. that uh, that's a really good trait. So there's a yeah. balance. There's a healthy balance. I didn't have yes. it, but definitely a positive and a negative. Wonderful. For those of you who's just joining with us, I'm speaking with Amy Turner, and we're speaking about her memoir on the ledge, which chronicles her life as far as a little girl all the way up until today. We're from a lawyer that she went through for so many years, 20 years, and then all of a sudden a seventh grade school teacher. Wait, for the people who read this book, what do you want the takeaway to be for them? The experience for them? Well, um, I, that it honestly, it's never, t- it is never too late for personal growth. Mm-hmm. I was you know, 57 when this truck hit me. And, and as I said, I don't recommend that technique, but <laughs> <Yes>. I, um, <laughs> I was, um, you know, I'd had a lot of therapy, and and I'd had the benefit of a wonderful therapist, and I really felt like I'd resolved all my issues. If I were truly honest, I knew there was part of me that was constrained, but I had a happy marriage, my kids were okay, I had a career. And so in the process of the recovery of this truck it, uh, from the accident, it turned out that my acupuncturist started studying in trauma release. And Mm. through that work on my nervous system, I feel like I was able to release that, you know, trauma that was still lodged in my nervous system. So long winded answer to say, just keep at it. You know, I, you know, I, by the time, you know, it's 60, 65, I'm feeling such, um, gratitude and growth from this experience and i might have um i might have i had kind of given up and settled Mm -hmm. so that's what i would say and for anyone who has a creative impulse i would say silence your internal critic revision is your friend just get it out it's so um don't think about what the outcome is Mm -hmm. Uh, because just allowing that creative flow is healing, you know, in and of itself. And, um, oh, I'll give an example for my father so people aren't, aren't left with just that image of him on the ledge. So he did struggle, you know, really with depression and anxiety most of his life. And But when he was in his 70s, my parents finally sep- uh, divorced, and he met another woman. <laughs> another Virginia, so it was amazing, but anyway, another Virginia who is an artist. And he had, my, the chapter's called My Father's Renaissance. And he was able to get access to his full creativity. And he started oh, whittling ballet dancers and charcoal drawings. And, you know, he was in love and loved at the same time for the first time. 
Wow. And there were the happiest years of his life from 70 to when he died at 93. Oh, so I, wow. so really the, the message of my family is it really isn't, it's never too late for anything. It's never too late. Wow. That's beautiful. That's so work. neat that he was able to access that for himself too. I mean, to be able oh. to, yeah, it's so neat to see that creative side being unlocked like that. You know, and I think this is just coming to me. Um, I think it's a matter of safety. When we finally on our deepest level feel safe, mm -hmm. then the creative impulse can just flow. We're not trying to control it or what, you know, afraid of what's going to come out. Yeah. That was the case for me in writing because I'd had all this trauma release work. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a situation for my father because he really felt cherished by this woman. And so, um, I think that created a safety where he could just express himself. Yes. That's amazing. What's next for you yeah. after um, su the success of your first book? What's yes. Next? Thank you. I'm really enjoying talking to people about it. It seems um, that uh, people are relating to it. So it's wonderful. I love that. Um, I'm going to get a little space and then see what comes up next for me. I, mm -hmm. my great grandmother kind of is pinging at me. So that might be a topic for the future. Mm, okay. And we'll, um, yeah, she was an interesting woman. But I'm thinking maybe I will fictionalize, you know, some kind of historical fiction. Uh -huh. But uh, I don't think that's I exciting. Did. Yeah. Yeah. So the I'm, sky's the limit for you and anything you do. Yes. Thank you for all of us. Yes. And I, I, yeah. And as you said, it's never too late. So. You could be in your deathbed and still writing. And that's a wonderful yeah, I, I probably everybody. will be scribbling notes. <laughs> that is so funny. How is, uh, you know, after all of this, after writing everything, what's, what's different for you and what's the same? Oh, that's, I like that question. Well, what's different from, for me really is that I, I'm not having any anxiety about this. That mm. somehow uh, you know, the publication process is kind of fraught, and I, I was nervous about it. But once it was out, I just feel very clear, very blessed, and just very grateful. Um, so that, that's been wonderful, and maybe that's, a new, that's new for me, to have on a, on a sustained basis, you know? Yeah. And um, so that's new. What's the same? The same is a deep appreciation for my family with all mm. their struggles, each one of my siblings, my parents, just a deep appreciation. There's a poem that's either titled, I Survived My Life, or it's a, you know, in the poem, and they all did and found a way on some level to thrive, even as mm. they met their challenges. And so... That hasn't changed. A huge amount that's, of appreciation for that. That's wonderful. Well, Amy Turner, I have enjoyed speaking with you. And of course, complimenting you getting to learn more about you know, your own backstory, but also your memoir on the ledge. If my viewers and listeners would like to find out more information about you and to purchase this book, where would they find all this information online? Uh, easiest place is probably to go to amyturnerauthor.com. You can read more about the book, their purchasing options. It's on Amazon and there's some resources and just more background and you can contact me uh, on the contact page. And I love to hear from readers and, or people who are interested in the topic. Wonderful. My viewers and listeners also know that if you can't find this information any other place, simply go to the show notes at jamesmillerlifeology.com and I'll link you with Amy Turner. Amy, thanks again for, for being a fantastic guest on my show today. Oh, thanks. It's really been a great pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>